It is to Paradise release day. I'm working. I already put my copy of work aside, so I'm going to, on my break, purchase it and start it immediately. I'm so excited. <laughs> Things have lined up perfectly for me to start this book today. I'm I am so excited right now. Hello. Welcome to the Teapot Reads. My name's Sam. I'm the Teapot. And this is what I'm currently reading. I picked up to paradise yesterday. I'm so excited. I am already really enjoying it. I am on chapter four of part one. So 28 pages in. And um, this is just, this is just a reading vlog. I want to take you through reading this book. I have been very excited for this book since it was announced because I loved A Little Life and I love Honey and Agahara, I think. Well, I'm only basing that off of A Little Life, but I loved the writing. And just based off the first 30 pages or so, I I enjoy the writing in this a lot too. Very different voice already, but I'm okay with that. It feels much older. The, the, the writing style and the language feels older, which is intentional, I think, because it said, the first part is set in 1893. I'm really enjoying it. It feels like a nice, comfortable, um, just like embrace, I guess. So, so yeah, to paradise. It is finally time and you guys get to come with me. I don't know how often I'll update or with what. I was considering annotating this book. I'm not going to. I've decided against that now. It was a consideration. I'm just mentioning it. I think I decided not to because I just want to sit and embrace and enjoy the book. The last time I annotated a book was for A Marvelous Light. And while that went okay, uh, I think it did detract a little bit from being able to be super involved with the story. I was more involved with the physical text than I was with the story, which had its, had its uh, pros and cons. Like it wasn't a bad decision. I enjoyed doing it, but I really just want to in interact with the story directly and just enjoy the ride and be there for it and be more present in it. So no annotating this, but maybe someday I will go back and annotate it because I have a couple copies that are coming. This is the only one I have right now, but I did order a signed one from uh, Barnes and Noble. And I also ordered the Goldsboro edition because I had to, <laughs> like I could not. For those of you new here, if this is your first video, I broke a tooth a couple weeks ago and today I get to go to the dentist. They're finally able to see me. It's I'm not in pain, so that's okay. It's a little sore, but it's it's not really that bad. So they get to, um, or they finally got the availability to see me today. So they're going to inspect my tooth. And I really hope they're going to be like, yeah, we could fix this real easy. But um, I'm not actually thinking that'll be the case. But maybe, maybe it will be the case. That would be ideal. But something tells me no. <laughs> um, so that's happening today. Otherwise, I was going to try to record a video. I was going to try to record a bookish ASMR video, but I don't know if that's going to work out because the space I wanted to use, uh, my brother is using for school, so maybe not. I'll have to rearrange some things. We'll see. Maybe I'll just do it in my room. I just don't know how the audio will be. But other than that, yeah, just reading today. Just reading. I'm really excited gonna be good. I love the dentist. I actually think the dentist is my favorite of like all the different types of doctors to visit. I just find it really relaxing and I like getting my teeth professionally cleaned but I'm really really anxious to go today because it's a new dentist. I've never been to them before and I've also not been to the dentist since COVID started so I don't know what I mean, COVID, it, it probably won't change that much. The dentist always wears a mask anyways, but I don't know. I just, I'm quite anxious about it. Um, and I need to get up now and just like get ready to go. But 
it's my legs feel like too heavy to get up i think when i get home i'm gonna take my dog for a walk if it's not too dark out and then take a bath or maybe eat dinner i don't know might be dinner then bath it could be bath and dinner I just finished part one and I'm too far. And I realized I didn't really talk about what this book is about. So before I get into my thoughts on part one, uh, I think it'd be best to talk about what this book <laughs> is about. Um, so the description of it wasn't super clear, but I have gathered from reading part one and from a few reviews that I've looked at, I've tried to stay away from anything spoilery, but, and I actually have succeeded. I haven't seen anything like that I consider a spoiler. I've had a look at a couple reviews um, because people I know have posted them or been talking about them. And because I did want some answers kind of to what the book is about uh, before I actually got far. They're set in three time periods, 1893 within an alternate, sort of historical period. I saw one review um, compare it to like Henry James's uh, New York, because um, it's set in New York, uh, particularly centering around Washington Square. I've never been to New York. I don't know much about the makeup of the city. I do know that that's a wealthy neighborhood and was like the neighborhood of the elites, especially at this period. Then it's set in, 1993 um, with a different set of characters uh, also in New York during the AIDS epidemic and then it's set in 2093 in a semi dystopian near future um, I'm not sure if the 1993 and 2093 sections are continuations of the same alternate historical world that's built up in the 1893 section. I really hope they are because I thought it was really interesting this this makeup of the um, North America. I guess we'll just say North America. I think the in it's an interesting makeup. Um, we actually have a map which I did keep checking because I thought it was so curious and so interesting. Um, to the free states cool. over here the free states um is like a utopia and then we have the colonies which is the south very much um pre-civil war south and then we have america or the american union which is like pre and pre-civil war slash post-civil war because like they won the war of rebellion but didn't take the southern state something like that then we have the West, which is like the Wild West, and the Kingdom of Hawaii down here. So I can only assume Alaska belongs to Russia. Um, <laughs> we, they don't talk about Russia. It's not on this, or uh, they don't talk about Alaska. It's not on this map, so why not, right? I don't know. So like the description doesn't say much about the plot of any of the sections. Part two. I think is about the son of the rightful king of Hawaii who isn't in charge of Hawaii, something like that. And then part three is about a scientist's daughter trying to find her husband, I believe. But part one, which I just finished, is about David. And actually, here's the other thing. I guess every single section, even though the characters aren't directly connected, like biologically or familially, all there's like the same name so there's a david and a word a charlie or charles a charlie is our protagonist in the last one in all of the stories and also the house on washington 
square is the same in all of them, I believe. So it's, it's a very much a gimmick for the book to have these repeating characters um, in a way. Uh, physical characters, I guess we'll call them. And I think obviously it's going to literarily have this repetition as well. But part one is about David. He is the eldest son to the wealthiest family in New York, which is the capital of the Free States. Uh, he is a Bingham, which means like he's like the the wealthiest family. No one is richer than them in the world or something like that. Um, certainly in North America. And he is very much just a leaf in the river and he doesn't want to be a leaf in the river anymore. He wants control of his life but he is at the beginning of part one letting it come to him basically. He's just waiting for it to announce itself. And in the meantime he becomes introduced to Charles Griffith who is a suitor and a possible marriage match because set up marriages are really important in the society especially among the wealthy and so he's introduced to Charles who he gets along with but who he doesn't love and who's certainly not life coming to greet him or if he is life coming to greet him certainly isn't the life that David wants and then he meets Edward Bishop, who is a piano teacher and a much poorer man. And he is the life and the excitement and the opportunity that David thinks he wants. And so he, he kind of takes the path of Edward and the part one is following that. And I... Oh, I have mixed feelings. I actually really think that it's a great section in the amount of things I could talk about and it's very rich in that category. Like I could talk about the way that David reacts to certain things and even just him expecting life to come and approach him. I think that's like there, there's a million things I could talk about. His grandfather, his relationship with his siblings, the way that relationships work in the story, the way that storytelling works in the story, who to believe, because there's conflicting stories about characters' backgrounds. Like there's a, a lot really there as well that I love and would love to dig into. And if I give this book a full review, I probably will talk about that. I didn't like David as a character. I really disagreed with a lot of his actions. Well, I shouldn't say that. I didn't like David as a person. As a character, I found him interesting. And again, I think there's a lot of rich richness to his character that we could talk about but him as a person I disliked I I look at his place in life and say my god man just appreciate what you have you have everything I do try to be objective because I do definitely think there's a lot of personal bias coming through there but even being objective we're clearly meant to look at David and not think he's making the right decisions or good decisions and even David realizes he is being an asshole quite a few times throughout the narrative. As for the other characters, we really don't get much of them. I thought they were all intriguing and interesting. I think the grandfather was my favorite side character and then Edward after that, but we don't really get closeness to them, which is fine. I didn't I don't think that's a, like a negative for the storytelling. I just didn't have much to grab onto there. I saw one review called part one a uh, self-contained novella and yeah I definitely see that it very much is structured like a novella and there was the same review um, I will have to try to find it and link it down below but it it was also comparing it to like a Henry James novella and yeah I really felt that <laughs> I was like yes that's that's kind of what I'm reading right now even down to like the way it's written it feels that way like the language um, which I was okay with. I thought that was good. I, I also, I really did enjoy the language. Hanya Yanagihara's writing is beautiful. Especially when it's this sort of forced, prosaic, classical, not classical, but like classic Gilded Age writing. I love that. And I'm really curious to see if that, the style of writing changes in the next two sections. Being a novella-ish narrative though, I 
felt a bit unsatisfied with the ending because it is this book is big being done with part one shouldn't mean being done with that narrative and hopefully even if it's just through loose connection like I don't need to know answers I just need to know um, or see how the overarching theme kind of continues so hopefully that is resolved like we get to see more resolution to these themes that are brought up because a lot of the themes are brought up and they're approached and they're gotten very close to starting the the arc of completion but they're not completed so hopefully the next two sections will continue those arcs and complete them by the end to give me some satisfaction if you don't that's gonna be a negative but right now it's okay this review that compared part one to a novella also talked about how part two feels a lot like a collection of short stories and how part three feels like a novel. And so these are just three almost completely separate entities put into one book, one binding with some sur the, the the review basically made it sound like surface level relationships between the stories. So that is concerning. I don't know if that's true. That's definitely gonna be something that like, I have to judge for myself. But I am a little concerned about that because if that is the case, I'm gonna be really frustrated. As much as I am enjoying this book so far, I don't feel that feverish adoration that I had with A Little Life, which I knew would likely be the case. I'm not gonna sit here and be like, oh yeah, I thought I was gonna fall in love with it the same way. I didn't. A Little Life is very much a novel unto itself. There will be nothing quite like that ever in my reading experience. I can't ever imagine coming across something like that. But I was hoping for a little more early love for this this book. I was hoping to be like, yes, this this is this is going to be great. I just know it. Because I feel like I knew that pretty early in A Little Life. And this one, very much has me wary. I wouldn't say it's it's gonna be a hard one to rate, I think, if it keeps on this track. I say right now I'm sitting at a four, four and a half stars because I'm I'm really, really thoroughly enjoying it. I just don't have that extra spark that's moving it past four and a half stars. So hopefully it gets that spark. Very wary of it though. I I'm really approaching this carefully and with a bit of concern because as much as I want it to be really good, I don't want to overestimate how good it's going to be. I don't want to put myself to high expectations just to be like severely disappointed because I don't want to be severely disappointed. We're really going to have to see how they connect because my thoughts are going to depend like completely on how they end up connecting because if it's just like paper thin, um, not not for me then oh well right but we're not gonna get ahead of ourselves i do want to do a bit more reading i definitely want to get into part two tonight i've been aiming for 70 pages a day and this is day three so that would be 210 i want to hit so really not that much more just that i'm on page 181 now so really reasonable i think I'm really curious just I do think if I don't do a full review uh, I will do some sort of discussion um, because there really will be a lot to talk about with this book just even section one like I don't want to spoil anything but basically we have a character who tells a story about something he's done and the other character believes him just like hands down and the reader is kind of left thinking at least I was left thinking. I don't want to speak for everyone, but I was left thinking. This seems fishy, but I want to believe him. And then later on, we get a contradictory story. And you're like, I want to believe this and not like this seems more realistic. But I feel like if you're reading between the lines, you also have just as valid an argument to think okay maybe this is the fishy false one like there's motivation here for this to be wrong and then you get the original character's response to this contradictory story and again you want to believe 
them and their answers, but it just everything feels fishy. So you kind of have to, as the reader, choose who you're going to pit yourself against and who you want to believe. And that very much reflects David, um, his, his reflections, his own internal battles. So there's very much a mirroring there. And I think the the, the who we choose to believe and why uh, also an interesting discussion because the character with the contradictory statement and the character with the initial statement are very different and on very different ends of almost every spectrum that we see play out in this book. Not all of them, but a lot of them and a lot of important ones for the narrative of book one. So, yeah, I don't want to spoil it so I can't really be more specific than that, but it's just really, really cool to look at and I'm hoping we're gonna see more of these kinds of questions and these kinds of moments pop up in parts two and part three but I don't know I don't want to get in my head myself and guess what's going to happen because I, I have no idea part two is gonna like reset completely with new characters and part three will do the same thing I'm actually kind of hoping that part two is a little lighter because book three or part three is the thickest of them all part three is Part one, part two, part three. You know, part three is definitely the thickest. Parts one and two, about the same. Part three is about twice as long. So about the same length as parts one and two combined, it looks like. That's the one I'm most concerned about connecting with. I'm not a big historical reader, like historical fiction reader, but I find it easier to connect to that than near future dystopians because I really hate dystopian <laughs> literature. Um, it's been a while since I've had one I enjoyed. So I'm really, really hoping I'll be able to connect with, with part three. That's the most concerning. Even before seeing any reviews for this book, that was always the most concerning part. But let's, let's hope it's not an issue. It's really just going to depend on how, how the characters act in their settings, I think. But for now, I am going to get ready for bed, do a little editing of a video. I think that's what I have on my list of to do today. Do a couple other things and um then go to bed i guess i'm very tired <laughs>
I guess I did have high expectations, but I didn't have expectations on what kind of a book it was going to be or really what it was going to be about because I definitely knew it wasn't going to be like A Little Life. I knew it would be different. The most disappointing thing are the characters. And I did see someone else who I follow on Instagram actually point out that the characters are really two dimensional. I don't necessarily agree. I think we just, especially when you compare them to like Willem or Jude or JB or Malcolm, we don't see enough of them to really get a firm grip in their lives. I do think that they're three dimensional and that they have a lot to them. They feel like well-built characters. We just see so little of them that it's almost impossible to bond with them. This doesn't feel like it's a book about characters though, so much as it is a book about theme. And I think that's interesting to like purposefully write a book about theme and idea rather than like plot or characters or even like a concept, like like time as a concept, like it's not that, it's a theme. Uh, I don't wanna say it's a moral, but it's close. Part two is set in 1980 or 1993. And it's not, I don't think it's our 1993. I don't think it's our 1993. I think it's an alternate 1993, but not the same alternate 1993 that would have come from the alternate 1893 we saw in part one, it feels like that feels like a couple steps removed from real history. This feels like a step or a half step removed, if if that, like it's, it's much closer. But I, it's still enough liberties taken that I don't think it's meant to be our 1993. I could be wrong. I don't know that much about the history of Hawaii. I did a little bit of research while I was reading this section because I was curious about some things. But I think like enough of a liberty has been taken with the Binghams that it's not our reality. So part two is split into two sections that are very distinct. Part one is about David Bingham. Yeah, David. So David Bingham, just like in part one, is about a David Bingham. So here, let me show you how long the parts are. So this is <laughs> book two. This is part one, this tall one, and then this is part two. So part two is a little longer, and I would definitely say part two is more interesting. Part one is about David Bingham, and he is, or we're, we're seeing really just one night in his life play out, and he does have reflection, and actually like forward reflection as well. The book takes us uh, several years into the future, a couple points to see where David ends up in relation to other characters, which I did really appreciate. I thought that was really wonderfully done and it left us enough suspense early on that, you know, we had like questions and then near the end to answer like different questions, it took us forward a little bit while still leaving some suspense there. And basically it didn't, it didn't give us anything that would have ruined or affected the, the currentness of the story. So it is David over the course of one night, he is living with his much older, much wealthier boyfriend in 1993, New York. And it is a dinner party for his boyfriend's friend who is going to be dying or like is dying, but has chosen like the next day to be like his last day and then to be, um, uh, medically killed. I forget how they're going to do it. And then part two. Oh, also while, while this dinner party is happening, David has a letter that he'd received earlier that day that he refuses to look at, that he knows is about his father who has been sick and dying and who he does not have a good relationship with and who he basically told everyone was dead. Uh, part two is David's father. Um, we get, I know they, it's a full name, and I'm so sorry. I'm probably going to mispronounce it. Kawika. Kawika. Um, who is... Yeah, he's dying. He's he's not really... He is technically the heir to the Hawaiian throne. Oh, wait, I was saying something else, though. He's talking in first person, and it's kind of like a letter, but it's not the actual letter that David has, because... 
David's father, Rika, is um, sick. And not in a coma, but not verbal, blind. He is dying, and so he, he's kind of composing this letter in his mind, and he recognizes that it's in his mind, and that it's not something David is going to see. But he's sort of recounting for David his own childhood, and then what kind of his side of the story that kind of led to them to split and for um, like how he got into this uh, position. So it's really interesting because in those two parts we don't see any overlap. Like Wika is, is complete, like he's talking about David in some sections. So there's overlap there and David does reflect on his father in his section as well, but they, um, they don't really overlap story-wise at all. Besides that, which I did think was interesting and I actually liked that we were sort of like back, back feeling uh, the plot. I thought that worked well. I thought they balanced well. I thought that in some ways the connections that we have between books one and two in here were really interesting and really strong and really something worth talking about. But in other ways they felt very separate. There are a lot of mirrors. Uh, we have a David Bingham in both. We have an Edward an Edward Bishop in both. We have Eden, Peter, um, a lot of reused character names. Charles, obviously, can't, can't believe I forgot Charles. Um, like we have those connections and even between the characters, even though they're not related, like genetically or um, familially at all to the characters from part one, there are still mirrors and connections there and I really liked how those followed through. I also really liked this theme of the balance between choosing life and like, and not life necessarily by being alive, but like by doing things, um, the, between choosing that and letting the world just happen around you because David Bingham in the first story battles with it and Wika in this story and David in the story battle with it, but in very different ways. And I think that's interesting. I'm definitely not going to be able to cover and talk about everything that I want to talk about in relation to this sec to this like book too. In this video, it would just go on forever. This isn't necessarily like meant to be a review. I just kind of want to touch on things. So do know that I could definitely talk deeper about all of these things and want to, I think. Um, also, I don't want to spoil anything here. I am going to talk about spoilers in a second, but I will like indicate when that starts, so don't worry. A small thing I wanted to talk about was the way that the um, dialogue works in part one of book two. My goodness, this book is divided in too many sections. It's, it's a little ridiculous. It's actually getting on my nerves a little bit because part three, I did look, part three has its own table of contents and I'm just like, this is getting ridiculous. Just make it three separate texts. I don't know. Don't market it as a novel. I don't think it works as a novel. It, it does more feel like a collection of novellas, which I think would have been fine. I think it should have been marketed that way, but we'll see how I feel after part three. But in part one of book three, I, nope, part one of book two, uh, David's dialogue is not in quotation marks. And I really liked that. It made me kind of go like, his voice was both like softer in my head and also more important. Uh, Cause it felt like it was thoughts internalized as well as externally said because characters were like responding to it. So I did really like that. I also, um, I like how that almost mirrored Wika who can't speak, whose who's everything is happening in his head and it's just like a kind of like visual continuation of that. I felt like I liked that. I thought that was really nice and really clever and enjoyable. And again, the writing in this is beautiful and gorgeous and very easy to keep reading. It's like buttery. It's great. Okay. Spoilers. Spoilers ish. Spoilers ish. Actually, no, I lied. Spoilers are not starting now. When the spoilers start, I will put something up so you know the spoilers are starting but I want to talk about one other thing before I talk about the spoilers let me get a little life okay I have like five copies of this book but this is the one I read so this is the one I'm familiar with here we go this one um 
comparing an author's text to another of that author's text, I think is very hard and can sometimes be inappropriate for the text that you're comparing to each other. Because like every, every text should stand on its own outside of a series. But I feel like I cannot talk about To Paradise without talking about A Little Life for a few moments. This book is so good because of the characters and horrible things happen to the characters but you're so invested in the characters you're pressed so closely against them that it feels personal and that's what makes this book so good. The writing is great, the writing is beautiful but it's the characters in this book that make it important and that make it bearable to read and that make it good and interesting. And this book, To Paradise, just doesn't do that. It's missing, I would say it's missing the spark of A Little Life, except it's not missing the spark, it's missing the heart of this book, which are the characters. Like this book would be really, really boring if you didn't like Jude or Willem, but mostly Jude. This book is kind of boring. It's still enjoyable, but it's boring because there's just no one to enjoy, you know? And there's no plot that makes it interesting. In fact, um, part book two is pretty much plotless. Part two has more plot than part one. Part one is like a snippet, um, but it's, it's almost like a character study without the character study part. Like, they both are. It's like, it's it's very much just a theme study, you know? Okay, I wanted to say that. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to compare it to A Little Life too much. That seems unfair. A uh, Little Life is, after all, my favorite, my favorite novel, so. It would be, it would be mean of me to compare anything to this book, even something else Hanya has written. But I do wanna talk about one other thing in this book and in this book. But this is where the spoilers kick in. So I'm gonna put the banner up, spoilers. It'll stay up until the spoiler section is done. Um, and it's actually going to be spoilers for A Little Life and Through to Paradise, that's both of them. It's a major spoiler for A Little Life. So if you haven't read it, or look away. Like even if you think, if you think you're gonna read it and you're like, no, I can handle the spoiler. No, don't, don't do that to yourself. It is going to be hard enough when you get to it without knowing this is going to happen. Um, this is, this is like literally on one of the last pages of the book. So please look away if you haven't read this book. Okay. Hopefully you are skipping ahead. So in a little life, it's very much set in like our world or supposed to be. Obviously liberties are taken, but besides that, it's set in our world. There's a section in here, in the final section in Lisbonard Street, um, the second Lisbonard Street. I'm going to try so hard not to cry. My phone just filled up. So I had to just go delete stuff in the midst of being in a little bit of emotional turmoil. Okay, um, so this is Harold talking. My God, I'm going to try not to cry. Um, I'll talk about it before I read it aloud. So it is a very small section. It is the only section in the entire novel that I can remember thinking this is getting very close to speculative fiction, to science fiction, and I thought it was really interesting. And I'm bringing it up from a little life because something very similar happens into Paradise. And I really just want to put it out into the world. I don't necessarily want to talk about it or dive deep into it, but I really want to put it out there and just be thinking about it, especially going into part three, which is a sci-fi book. Okay. <laughs> Do you think he was happy with me? Because he deserved happiness. We aren't guaranteed it. None of us are, but he deserved it. But you only smile. Not at me, but just past me, and you never have an answer. It is also then that I wish I believed in some sort of life after life. That in another universe, maybe on a small red planet where we have not legs but tails, where we paddle through the atmosphere like seals, 
where the air itself is sustenance composed of trillions of molecules of protein and sugar, and all one has to do is open one's mouth and inhale in order to remain alive and healthy. Maybe you two are there together, floating through the climate. Or maybe he is closer still. Maybe he is that great cat that has begun to sit outside our neighbor's house, purring when I reach out my hand to it. Maybe he is that new puppy I see tugging at the end of my other neighbor's leash. Maybe he is that toddler I saw running through the square a few months ago, shrieking with joy, his parents huffing after him. Maybe he is that flower that suddenly bloomed on the rhododendron bush I had thought had died long ago. Maybe he is that cloud, that wave, that rain, that mist. It isn't only that he died or how he died. It is that he died believing. And so I try to be kind to everything I see, and in everything I see, I see him. Oh. Okay, so that is the closest the book gets to speculative. <laughs> um, and, like, it was striking the first time I read it. It is, it is still striking now. Um, and in a much uh, less emotional note, because this book doesn't inspire even sort of that kind of emotion, uh, similarly, at the end of section, or no, part one of book two, we have David kind of forward thinking. So, okay, present David is forward thinking on a possible future he might have with his partner, with his boyfriend, Charles. There's, like, we also get to see, like, actual glimpses of the future of, like, like, actual future of David. So this is not that. This is, like, a speculative thing he's just, like, thinking of. Um, and it's really long, so I don't think I'm going to read the same thing. Let's see. It was then that he had a sudden vision of the two of them many years later, in some undated time far into the future. Outside the world had changed, the streets had been overgrown with weeds, the cobblestones in the courtyard were shaggy with pampas grass, and the sky was a vicious green, and a creature with rubbery webbed wings glided past them. A car puffed down Fifth Avenue, hovering a few inches above the ground, hissing air as it went. The garage was a ruin, half decayed, its bricks soft and cakey, and in the middle of it, thrusting its way through the crumbling roof, grew a mango tree, just like the one that had grown in the front yard of the house where he had once lived with his father, its branches bulbous with fruit. If it wasn't quite the end of things, then it was close. The fruit was too poisoned to eat, the car was windowless, the air shimmered with oily smoke, the creature had settled atop the building across the street, its talons gripping the parapet, its black eyes searching for something to swoop down upon and devour. But inside, he and Charles were somehow the same as they were. Still healthy, still there, still magically themselves. There were two people in love, and they were making themselves something to eat, and there was plenty of food, and as long as they stayed indoors together, no harm would come to them. And to their right, at the far end of the kitchen, was a door, and if they opened that door and walked through it, they would find themselves in a replica of this house, except in that house would be Peter, alive and sarcastic and intimidating, and in the house to the right of his would be John and Timothy and Percy, and in the house to the right of theirs, Eden and Teddy, and on and on and on, an unbroken chain of houses, the people they loved resurrected and restored, an eternity of meals and conversations and arguments and forgiveness. Together they'd walk through these houses, opening doors, greeting friends, closing doors behind them, until at last they'd come to what they somehow knew was the final door. And here they'd pause a moment, squeezing each other's hands before turning the knob and entering a kitchen just like their own. The same jade green walls, the same gilt-edged china in the cupboards, the same framed etchings on the walls, the same soft linen dish towels hung on the same ash-carved pegs, but in which a mango tree was growing, its leaves brushing the ceiling. And here, sitting on a chair and patiently waiting, would be his father, and when he saw David, he would spring to his feet, his face alight, crying with joy, my kawika, and he'd say, you've come for me, you've finally come for me. He wouldn't hesitate, but would run toward him while behind him, Charles stood and beamed, watching this final reunion of father and a son finding each other at last. So there's also another section in part one that gets kind of speculative, but it, um, I don't remember where it was, and I don't think it's as important. But yeah, I just wanted to put those those two sections out there let's like let's let them ferment spoilers out for spoilers out for I didn't really do much today I haven't been feeling well <laughs> not COVID but uh, just not feeling well I do want to do a lot more reading I am gonna go see what we're doing for dinner if we're if we've got plans or if I should just make food and then I'm going to after dinner I think uh take a bath do some reading in the bath and yeah, 
I guess that's it. Just read and do some editing on a video work for the night. That sounds good. That sounds relaxing. I hope you can hear me over the fan because I'm not plugging the microphone in right now, but I, I'm in part two of book three and I am finding that I am not a fan of, of books with viruses um, and pandemics when living in a pandemic. This is stressing me out a lot more than I thought it would. Ah, uh, um, yeah, there's, um, <laughs> there's anxiety happening, so this fucking sucks. I, I think I knew about there being a virus in it. I didn't think it was going to be so in-depth. It's somewhat laughable because there's, there's been a couple statements that's like, oh, this is how people will react, and I'm like, that's not how people have reacted to this one, so that's interesting. But, um, in general, this just, just, just makes me very anxious, so, good to know that I will be avoiding a pandemic and disease stories probably for a long time. This is a lot. I have a little less than a hundred pages left. I am nearly done with the book. Actually, I have a little more than 50 pages left, so like 60 pages left. So it's it's even less than less than a hundred, I guess. Before I give my sort of final thoughts on the book before it's over, though I do want to share a couple life updates. Number one being that I have managed to re-injure my eye. If you have followed along with my channel for the last couple months, I think it was during the Anna Karenina reading vlogs that I hurt my eye the first time. And I think I've accidentally just reopened the, the wound. I don't know for sure. I have an appointment next week. Yesterday it hurt so badly by the end of the day. It was really, really bad. Today it's doing much better. I am taking as much care of it as I can. I've been using what's left of the medication that they gave me and I'm trying to just take it easy. Like, I am not doing anything stressful. I'm really not looking at screens. I am obviously recording this, but I'm not I like this isn't super stressful in the eye. Um, I'm not trying. I'm trying to spend not that much time on my computer. Um, I do want to do a little bit of editing for a video, but I don't think I'm going to let that exceed more than like 20 minutes today. Uh, as for reading, I did find yesterday that reading um, it actually didn't make the eye worse. Like there were some activities that it felt worse, but reading maybe it was just calming me. But it it felt like okay, so I am going to let myself read. Last time I really hurt, I did audiobooks. This time it's not as bad as it was, but reading has been okay. Again, trying not to read for more than like half an hour at a time though, just to kind of pamper the eye. I will be finishing To Paradise today though, and I will be sharing my final thoughts. I don't know if I'll be sharing them today or tomorrow, but yeah. The other big medical thing is I'm going to the dentist today. I think I don't think I actually um, finished wrapping up. I think I, I told you that I was going to the dentist last week. But I don't think I was like, oh, and this is why, or this is the result. So I broke my tooth a while ago, and about a while ago, I mean like the Tuesday before Christmas. And I say broke, it's, it's just cracked um, and like chipped off. So like a quarter of my tooth is missing and one of my molars. And 
the dentist, she told me that it's broken all the way down to the nerve, but my gums are protecting the nerve, so that's why it doesn't hurt that badly. But really the two roots that we have are she's going to try to save it, which is what today's appointment is for, and if she can't, um, it's going to be a root canal, which every time I'm like, yeah, the root canal is one of the options. People are like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I've had a root canal before. It was one of the best medical experiences I've ever had. Um, it was really good. Um, I was freaked out going into it. It did not hurt that badly. It has maintained. The dentist uh, the other day actually said that my root canal looks fantastic. Um, and I was also in so much pain leading up to that root canal that the root canal was just completely relieving. So I, I have a really good experience with root canals and I would totally be okay if I have to get another one. So um, that is, it's like not a scary prospect for me. It's just like, okay, that's one of the possibilities, but that is fine. So dentists actually don't freak me out. Eye doctors freak me out a lot, but dentists I actually find very relaxing. Um, I did also want to touch on uh, just a couple other things that I'm reading at the moment. I'm not going to go through everything because I am listening to an audiobook and I don't want to talk about that, but... Oh, and I actually want to talk about what I'm going to read next. Let me grab that too. Just because I'm not going to get another vlog up between this vlog and uh, the one after. Um, so the next one that we'll post is actually going to be the first of my Japanese reading vlogs. Well, I guess I should specify and say my Japanese literature reading vlogs. I'm going to be reading two Haruki Murakami books. I'm really excited and I'm really excited to do a vlog based around them. But uh, between Two Paradise and the Murakami vlog, I will be reading A Deal with the Elf King. Uh, this is by Elise Kova. This is the Fake Rate edition. Um, it's very pretty. It's shiny. It's a, um, a fantasy romance, and it's a standalone, and it's not, it's not long at all. It will be nice to have something lighter to read. And I really wanted a romance. I'm in such a romance mood. I was really debating if I wanted to pick up a historical romance or if I wanted to pick up a, a fan, like a lighter fantasy. And anyway, this basically felt like a good middle ground and I've really wanted to read these for a while. I recently was able to shortlist, not these editions obviously, but uh, shortlist the regular edition and bring it into work. And every time I pass the display that it's on, I'm like, oh, I wanna read that so badly. So I'm really excited to read this one. And I actually kind of lied. So the next vlog will actually either be the Haruki Murakami vlog or it'll be the Crescent City vlog, just depending on how quickly I get through that. But I'm thinking I'll get through that very quickly because I'm just being, I'm reading a lot of bulkier stuff. So that's gonna probably feel like a breeze. So it probably will be Murakami next. But just in case it's not Murakami, it's Crescent City. If it's, if it's um, Murakami next after that will be Crescent City. So I just have like planned vlogs the next couple before I do a little more of a chill like regular two week vlog, which is what I typically do. Um, I am also reading a uh, volume two of The Way of the House Husband by Kusuki Uno, um, or Uno, and um, this is just a fun little series. I really enjoy just their little vignettes. They're funny. They make me smile. Um, they're just so light and gentle and I really, really enjoy them. And I might actually finish this volume today because it's just really enjoyable. I only have volumes one and two, but I'll be picking up um, the later volumes, I'm sure soon. And then the last book I wanna talk about is The Bright Book of Life, Novels to Read and Reread by Harold Bloom. I picked this up yesterday. I had my eye on it and then it was actually scanning for due outs and I was like, I'm just gonna save it. I'm gonna bring it home with me. Um, I bought it, but you know. This is basically a series of essays talking about just novels and I was flipping through the table of contents and there are a lot of novels that I want to read and a lot that I, or not a lot, but a couple that I have read. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to just read the essay for each novel that I've read after I've like sometime after I've read them. So for now, all I can do is the Pride and Prejudice and I think Anna Karenina essays. 
but there are quite a few oh no I have another one there are quite a few on here of books that I really really want to read soon so um I think this will be interesting and just I don't really read a lot of critical essays now that I'm out of school but I kind of this is weird I miss it a little bit I don't miss having to necessarily analyze and go searching for essays and like writing papers etc but I do kind of miss the analytical aspect of college so I think this is gonna be a really enjoyable little book to keep returning to and I did start reading the Pride and Prejudice one I read the first couple paragraphs and I was like this is very very accessible and not at all difficult to read so like and they're not super super long like Pride and Prejudice is like not even 10 pages but I'm excited I've also been like staring I'm like have I read anything by Harold Bloom I don't know the name is like super familiar I probably have at some point but yes just wanted to tell you about this book and I will probably continue to return to it and talk about it in wrap-ups and stuff okay but to paradise to paradise the book you're here to hear about I have this much left I don't think the book is going to get above three and a half stars. I could be wrong. I still have enough time that I think that could change, but I have a feeling it's not going to. The themes that were set so well in parts one and two have fallen apart in part three. And I wanna say it's intentional because I can kind of see the through line. I can see, okay, this is, the consequences of apathy but also the consequences of decision like it's not really saying anything it's just like well here is what happens if you make decisions and here's what happens if you let decisions be made for you on both end in charlie and on charles's parts but i just i feel like it's it's waffling it hasn't picked you know, it's not, it hasn't picked like, this is where the theme is going. It's just like, the theme exists. And here it could go, and here it could go, and I don't know. It's a little boring. It's still engaging in that I want to keep reading it. And the characters in book three are definitely more interesting and engaging than in books one and two. Charlie is easily the most... I say enjoyable character but like the most like the closest you get to actually feeling anything specific I think because you don't really have the chance to catch on to any of the other characters whereas Charlie you do and I do like Charlie that being said it's still we don't get that much we don't get to dive too deeply into her we don't get to really live in her um it just it doesn't happen I have gotten emotional a couple times while reading it um, but I, I'm pretty sure it's because it's just a really bleak story and not because it's a sad story. Like, I'm just like overwhelmed by the bleakness and it's about pandemics and inevitability of pandemics and it fucking sucks. Like, I don't want to be reading about that right now. Um, I, I am really looking forward to being over with it so that I don't have to read about pandemics and... I didn't know how, I know that's like personal, like how much it affected me, but I just, like, wow, um, not a fan of this. This is not a novel I would have picked up or probably have continued with if, I probably would have DNF'd it in book two if I hadn't loved A Little Life so much and had such respect for Hanya Yanagahara as an author, but, um, I definitely would have probably got, like, just been like, you know what, this isn't for me and gotten rid of it in book two. I probably would not have even thought about picking it up. And I think that says something to you <laughs> about the book. There's a lot I think that will be discussable with this book, but I don't know if that is necessarily a good thing. The book puts a lot out there and opens a lot of questions, but it, it itself doesn't do any interrogating, I don't think or does very light interrogating of each question because there's just so much going on. And it's fine to leave those kinds of things to the reader, but 
you do have to sort of settle on some things and some answers. And so far, the book hasn't really done that. I am also really upset that it is advertised as a novel. It's not a novel. It's, it's like three short, it's like three novellas or three short stories. It's a collection and I think it's okay. It could have been fine as a collection. I'm not sure if I said that on camera already because I've been just thinking it a lot. One thing I think is interesting and I'm not, I'm not sure what to do with this. Charlie is autistic coded as a character, but like they don't use that term. They don't use that term at all. I would also say that uh, Wika in part in book two is also autistic coded. You know, you could probably go through and actually say David in book one might also be autistic coded, but they don't use that term. And I think it's especially interesting in book three, which is all about like medical things. And Charlie, um, she was sick and it was the result of the medicine they gave her that she started showing as autistic on the page. And I think that's interesting. And I think it's also interesting that a character remarks that there's no one else like her. And it's like, even if she's not autistic, she probably would get along well in those communities. And do those people just not exist? in this book, like that's weird to me. That's just thoughts I'm having while reading it. Okay, the, la the last thing I wanna say, cause I thought this was actually clever. Book one is about a utopia or like a capitalist utopia. And book three is about like a capitalist dystopia. And I think that's really clever, especially wedging in between the late nineties, which was a time that like thought it was so progressive and in some ways was, but then in other ways was so totally not like I think it's really interesting to wedge that between them and have utopia, dystopia bookend it. I think that's interesting. And I kind of think that's really clever, but that's probably the most clever thing about the, the way this book is framed. I think that's it for like final thoughts before I'm going into the final pages. This book, yeah, probably won't surpass 3.5 stars. Maybe I'm wrong, but I have a feeling that's where it's gonna sit. And I'm uh, really looking forward to being done with it and just, Moving on. It's definitely a book that's going to sit with me for a while, like mentally, but I just, I need to physically move on from it because it's so bleak. There's like no happiness at all in this, in this book. That's, I like in a little life, there was at least happiness. You know, there are moments of just like happiness so much. And those were almost, those, those were more emotional most of the time than the unhappy things. But this is just sad. Like, bad things keep happening. Oh well. Let's finish this bad boy up. Okay. <laughs> it's time to wrap up my thoughts on this book. It's actually been, oh, look on the cover. I may not love it, but I don't want it to be all dirty. I may not love it. Um, I don't love it. It's been a couple days since I finished it, actually. I, well, partly I, I waited to film Final Thoughts because I was, I finished it at night and then I had like a couple days of just work and being home with people I didn't really have any time to myself and I just needed to get some space from it because the ending I'm going to choose to believe it's a happy ending I did not like the ending this book I think overall I can say is an upsetting book and not in the way a little life is an upsetting book because a little life is an upsetting book but it's enjoyable and this one is just like bleak and there's not really anything to enjoy so not not a huge fan I ended up giving it three stars and walking out of the book I was like yeah there's probably a lot I could say about it like I could talk about the themes and how they both are fulfilled and just fail in part three or book three whatever uh, the characters how they're connected utopian versus dystopian um, the fate of America versus like the fate of the UK. I think that's interesting. Um, but 
it would almost be like forcing myself to continue talking about it because this book was just so, so gray. It was so grayscale. I didn't feel much while reading it. I did, it did give me this weird dream. So I've since I've hurt my eye again, I have had to do a lot of listening to things rather than looking. So I have, reading has been okay, but I've been trying not to look at, screen, at screens as often. And so I've been listening to a lot of Gilmore Girls. So I had this weird dream where it was like a dystopian Gilmore Girls episode. And they had to pick like whose head to chop off from like characters in the show. And it was like really weird dream. But this book kind of fueled it because I think it was the day after I finished it and I was still like fermenting every thought I had about the book. I don't, I don't know if I would have read this book if I hadn't read A Little Life. Probably not. It almost feels like, so a couple months ago, um, the new Anthony Doerr book came out. Uh, I don't even remember what it's called but it was like a big release. It was like the biggest release of the year. I don't, I disagree, but that's how it was being pitched at work. And so I was like, okay, I'll buy it. I'll read it so I can talk it up with the customers. I felt, well, I didn't finish it. I kind of forgot I was reading it. I felt like while I was reading it, like this is beautiful, but this is just not what I want to read or at least not right now. I do definitely think I will read that book and maybe enjoy it at some point. It's just like not a right now book. But it almost felt like I was just reading to paradise because like it, there was nothing in here that made me go, yes, this is a book that makes me wanna read it right now. Um, part, book one was maybe the exception. I really enjoyed book one. I, but I think I enjoyed it because of the setting and not for anything else. I just like enjoyed that time period and the way that the alternate history was, I really enjoyed that. But like, I don't think that meant it was good necessarily. <laughs> so yes, I, I guess I'm just kind of rambling at this point. All in this to say, maybe read it. It's not a book that I feel like you need to run out and read immediately. It's not that good. It's actually a bit disappointing if you're reading it, especially coming off a little life. I think that it definitely has its audience and it definitely has value to it in a way that really prevents me from saying this book was super disappointing and such a letdown because it wasn't such a letdown. It wasn't as bad as some other books I've been hyped for. It just wasn't really a book for me. Uh, I will say it probably affects if she writes any other books, I probably won't feel the urge to like immediately run out and read them like I did with Two Paradise. Like, oh no, I can wait a couple months until I'm feeling the vibe. Um, her writing is not good enough to save me from waiting on her books, basically. Which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, but for me is kind of a big deal because if you're one of my favorite authors, it really doesn't matter what your book is. I will just go out and read it and be like, well, fuck yes, this sounds amazing. Those are my final thoughts. Maybe skip this one. It's, if it sounds good to you on its own, regardless of anything else, like the author, past works, that kind of stuff, if it sounds good to you, read it. I think you'll enjoy it. But if it just doesn't sound appealing, I would skip it. It's really bleak, especially right now to read a book about pandemics in the middle of a pandemic is very upsetting. This is obviously a very different pandemic situation in the book, but it was still really not fun. And I was not a fan uh, in the least. I. I'm not going to be reading any other pandemic or probably dystopian novels for a long time. <laughs> I already don't like dystopian, but like, this was rough guys. This was really rough, but yes, to paradise. Here it is. Here's the beautiful book. Here it is. And, um, you were big. You were, um, you were an experience that I don't regret. I don't regret you. I just really wish you had a little more lightness inside and not just this un 
unbearable bleakness because it would have been nice to smile at some point while reading. Yeah, I think that's where I'm gonna leave it off. That is my thoughts on To Paradise. If you liked this vlog, if you liked this content and want to see more, definitely consider subscribing. I would really appreciate it. And if you are already subscribed, thank you so very much. It means the world to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you are somewhere cold, I hope you're staying warm. If you're somewhere warm, I hope you're staying comfortable. And most of all, I hope you're reading a great book. I will see you guys next time. Bye!